And welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, actually the inaugural podcast, the inaugural episode of uh, The Mind Sculptors. I am your host, uh, Callahan, and with me today is uh, honestly a legendary person in the uh, CEDH community, one of my favorite creators, uh, uh, Cobblepot from the Lab Maniacs. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, I'm honestly really honored to have you on. Uh, you guys were what got me into the format and into CEDH. Um, the first CEDH deck I ever built was, um, I can't remember whose list it was, but it was on the budget brews list uh, you guys had. And uh, it was the um, Thrasios Vile Smasher Paradox Storm list. That could have been Dan, but it might have been Siggy as well. Yeah, I can't remember whose it was, but I, to this day, if Paradox Engine ever somehow gets unbanned, we'll immediately go back to playing that deck. I oh loved my. it so much. Yeah, it was so much fun. I I will never forget imprinting a lightning bolt underneath an Isochron Scepter and winning that way. <laughs> oh man, I used to love. Uh, is it Chemister? I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, it's the two and a red. A uh, hasty goblin that you can pay red and tap it to um, exile a instant or sorcery from your graveyard, and yeah. then you could also pay red and tap it to exile or to copy all of the cards that you had exiled with him, and then cast them without paying their mana costs. And um, there's really no conceivable way to actually make that card work <laughs> without Paradox Engine. Yeah, and um, I was that was one of the the really um, sad things to to see leave the metagame uh, yeah, with Paradox uh, Engine. Unfortunately, I remember when Paradox Engine got banned. Um, I just remember everybody, all the Sase players, just kind of like hanging up the hat for a little yep. while because yeah, it just the deck just doesn't work. I have a friend who still plays it actually, um, and it's like okay, uh, but. You know, is what it is. So, right. um, so a couple things for you. So, uh, with that being said, you're like one of the people who a lot of people look to as like one of the big like deck building. You really push the boundaries with deck building, and um, so how did you even get into uh, CEDH to begin with? So, I mean, I I think most people start casual when right. they when they're they're first learning the game. And um, I, I think the so I I, I first learned about Commander uh, from my brother-in-law, and okay. um, he was way into it. And he had a, a group of friends who got together every every week, and uh, they played and they had a good time. And they invited me in, and I had a good time too, and thought it was really great. And uh, you know, being a kind of a internet savvy bookish person i was always yeah. going around trying to find what was going on in mtg salvation which was the the, the place oh, to man. go back then yeah. for for you know what was happening in the edh and i discovered um french or dual yep. commander which was kind of this little sub format that was taking place uh mainly in france but also kind of there were little silos huddled together in, in a couple of other places uh um, n none in the U.S. <laughs> of but, course, <laughs> um, they and there there were some really really cool things that people were doing, and it was it was sort of like a blending of what people had done in Legacy or Vintage, right. kind of using the card pool that was available to EDH. And um, I mean, obviously that's dual, so it's it, it wasn't mm -hmm. a four player. Um, so there it was really heavy into things like. Thought cast the you have your 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 thought sees and your inquisition right. of code select and you know um, the things that you don't see in EDH because it's heads up stuff and, that looks a lot more like what you would see in modern and legacy as far as like hand disruption and things like right. that. So uh, what when when people when when people today make comments about CDH and say that well it's just like vintage go play vintage go play legacy um, <laughs> that that argument holds water for for French. Because mm -hmm. the 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 cards that C play are very similar, um, right. whereas in four player the the what we use is is, is very different because you want to use what is going to maintain value in, in right. a four player. Um, but that was where I first 
started uh, trying to push a little bit into the competitive stuff. Okay, and and that was actually where um, where Boonweaver actually got started. Oh man, as well. So I, <laughs> I uh, one of the guys in our local meta game uh, for our local league still plays Carador Boonweaver to this Dang. day. Oh sure. Um, and I mean, he'll, he'll knock out games. He'll always finish in like the top 10. Like it's still a good, good deck. Right. It, it, the, it, it wasn't so much. I, I mean, so, so what happened was when partners came to be, <laughs> I, I think it was within a month or two, we, we had partners and, um, uh, Protean Hulk got unbanned. Like yeah, with, you know, it it was very very uh, close in time that those those two events took place, and I mean, if if you know the history of Boon Weaver, the the idea is that you're you're really trying to approximate kind of what people the degenerate stuff that people did with Protean Hulk, right. and um, it's like oh well, you know, if you use Pattern of Rebirth, you can you can kind of do this thing that's <laughs> sort of similar and kind of you know the same idea. It's not as good, um, but Getting Protean Hulk and getting partners to be able to get access to blue, mm-hmm. and you know, be able to to, to get access to a, a lot more card advantage to the card corridor just never was able to get a hold of. Um, I'm glad that people are still playing it. I yeah. I, I have I have officially hung up corridor for I, I think for good. Because I mean, one of the things too is in those days, I mean. There were not many great five color commanders. Like you had like uh, the sliver commanders, obviously. Right. Um, I think you Horde had Horde of Notions. Horde of Notions. Uh, you had uh, what's the one that people used to play food chain with? Um, oh man, Tazri, General Tazri. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, that that's know, that's had... more contemporary. That's newer. Yeah, I guess that is more contemporary. If you really, yeah. Um, not Iona, the like false god, Corona. Yes. Is that what it was? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and Child of Alara. <laughs> I have a friend who plays that. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's it's very interesting how partners and like these good five color commanders have just warped the metagame like around doing these different things. I mean, it's really interesting because... Uh, Phoenix, who I do a lot of deck building with, he's been playing CADH since about then too, and it's very interesting to hear him talk about like back when like Zer was like the deck, right? So the 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 thing that Partners gives you is the the, the flexibility to have access to color. I mean, um, you in in you know in the old days before Partners was a th- or you know, before Partners was a thing. You know, you you looked kind of on 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 two axes. You the one axis that you're looking at is okay. What 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 is the power that my commander is giving me? So you're looking at Zur, mm-hmm. you're looking at Jaleva, you're looking at Corridor, and um, you've you've got that that interesting ability mm-hmm. that it's giving you, and then you've got kind of this set of colors that comes along for the ride. And, you know, you're, you're trying to think of, okay, what sort of combos, what sort of patterns of play am I going to try to pull off um, that are going to fit with that, that ability that will also fit into that color uh, set. And right. um, the, the advent of partners just allowed you to make those decisions separately instead of having one uh, be right. dependent upon the other. So right. being able to say, I would like card advantage and a curiosity engine and <laughs> also get to choose what colors it is that that's actually right. going to be applied into. Um, and I mean, that's it's no secret that that has completely and utterly changed the way that people oh, approach yeah. deck building. Oh, for sure. Um, and I mean, and that that's really good because I mean, like, so one of the things we really uh, when we were talking before that I really wanted to talk about is uh, is really the deck building, how you make decks and how you brew. Um, you know, uh, I really started following you on Twitter when you started releasing stuff about Shadow Bag last year, mm-hmm. um, and it was just you were blowing my mind. <laughs> I was just like, oh shoot, you can't! Holy cow! Um, 
And so when it really comes into that, so you talked about how like, um, you know, it changes the way that you're thinking and starting to strategize uh, with, you know, how you're going to start and build your decks. Um, so for you, um, what is it that's that first thing that you really start with to build your deck around? So, um, so when, when you're looking at the initial concept phase of a deck, there's it it you're you're either gonna you're you're gonna do one of three things, let's say. So either you're you're starting with the commander, and um, the the commander itself is giving you something that's really interesting or something that's really novel that you want to try to see the extent to which you can exploit it. Okay. So um, Yarok with the doubling ability or um, Inala mm -hmm. with her eminence ability. Um, these are things that add a dimension to play that you don't get and you can't get with any other commander. Right. Um, so sometimes I'll start with that if the commander is offering something that you literally can't get Right. In an, in any other circumstance, and so you've you've got that commander. Now that commander has chosen your color, and um, from there, you that that's kind of like chosen the trajectory that you're gonna move. I mean, that's um, yeah. I mean, I get that. That's uh, that's been my boat with uh, Lavinia. <laughs> sure, sure. And I mean, L Lavinia kind of decides for you kind of what exactly. your best combo pieces are gonna be as well. And then your choices from there are kind of what, what kind of how are you going to decorate that? How are you right. going to what, what's the framework in which you're going to try to make that either as consistent or efficient as possible or as reliable and resilient as possible? You know, those those kinds of decisions then kind of dictate the rest of what goes into the deck. Right. Um, if, if you're not starting with the commander, maybe you're starting with a combo. So like shadow bag, for instance, yeah. um, shadow bag is is, is really it's, I mean, it started in, in Yogmoth just as a way of um, trying to improve the consistency with mm -hmm. which you could win off of any of the spells that drew you into lots of cards. So whether it was Necropotence or whether mm -hmm. it was Ad Nauseam or whether it was um, reanimating Villas and you know, um, <laughs> paying life into something. Uh, the idea with shadow bag was, okay, I've got some limited amount of mana and a lot of cards. What can I do to, um, increase the, the chances that I can convert that into a win? Because right. sometimes people would do an ad nause and, or especially if they did like a main phase ad nause, or they would do a necro for 30 and be like, well, um, this isn't great. Um, <laughs> it, the, the idea with shadow bag and, and, and if people aren't familiar with this shadow bag is basically you, you're, you're using bone miser, which is kind of like the, the, the mono black inverse waste knot. It's a it's five fantastic. mana. Yeah. It's a, it's a five mana creature. It, it's, it, it inhabits a style of play that's very similar to Gitrog, mm -hmm. um, where if you've got a, a discard outlet, then um, a lot of the same sort of tricks that you can do, that you can do with Gitrog, where if someone tries to interact with you and you just decide to discard again over the top of them and continue going, um, a lot of those same kind of things um, apply. But the idea is that um, because of the fact that you can choose with Bone Miser, what it is that you're going to discard as opposed to with waste not when people play waste not they'll they'll do waste not and then do a wheel of fortune and it's kind of like a roll of the dice because they right. don't know what it is that other players are holding they don't know what they're going to discard if they're going to do some sort of like you know mass discard spell or something like that um, because you can choose to say i'm gonna i'm going to discard a land here so that i know that i get two black and then i'm going to cast this other card from my hand and then discard something after that you know you you can piece together the, the a chain to win a lot more deterministically right um and then the the shadow and bag come from bag of holding and uh, shadow of the grave which both basically just take a look at however many whatever mm -hmm. cards you've discarded up until that point um you return all of them back to your hand and you can keep going which and and, and uh shadow of the grave is a very like unknown oh like, yeah rare from Amonkhet. 
Right, right. And it, and I mean, and still, I mean, it still is largely unknown. Yeah. And you know, bag of holding, it's 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 absolutely kind of a a, a fringe combo, um, but it 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 has it's 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 very powerful um, if it's piloted capably. Yeah. But but anyway, um, the the idea was. Uh, this was an interesting combo, and I found in mono black Yogmoth that it it really Im- Im- improved the post nos or post necro uh, mm-hmm. eff- you know effectiveness of of the deck, and um, I really I liked it, but I didn't like the fact that it was in mono black. <laughs> so it was like, well, okay, so what what, what can we do if we want to maybe transplant this apparatus into something else? What would be a good place for that to go? So this is, instead of starting with a commander, we're starting with a combo. Now we want to find the right home for that combo. So you want to think of, okay, well, what colors would be good? So in this case, it only needs mono black, but, you know, if we if we put it in a context that has blue, then it's going to have, you know, some, some better protection. If it's going to be in green, then um, some of the aspects of it that are for tutoring creatures are, you know, that's going to be more you know, a little bit more refined than it was and so on and so forth. So then I kind of trans transplanted that into Hapatra, which is yeah. the, um, the, the little uh, snake God. Um, and she, you know, brings to the table the, um, she, she brings a lot of creature tutors, which are, are useful for being able to either, you know, get boon, uh, a Bone Miser into your hand or, you know, get them, you know, cheat them onto the table and that kind of thing. Uh, but it also has crop rotation, which <laughs> is crop rotation into emergence zone is very, very good with, with Necropotence um, right. because it, it rather than playing Necropotence with Shimmermer or something like that, being able right. to cast all of your spells instead of just your, your artifacts uh, winds up being, being pretty good. Um, who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. Who would have thought? <laughs> so, um, but so, you know, you, you can, if you, if you look at the, 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 the lists, I, I had probably five or six lists over the course of yeah. two or three months where I was just trying that combo in different housings, with different colors to see what worked really, and right. and that's that's a thing that I th- I think is that it's a good practice for everybody to try. Um, mm-hmm. you, we we have something in and we we were tweeting about it a little bit actually earlier today, where and and not just in CEDH you see this in all all the magic right. communities but CEDH especially there's kind of like this elitism. Of you know, well, no, that's not good enough, or right. you know, that's that's never going to work. That's not going to pan out. Um, and also, this this idea of uh, it's it's called functional fixedness, which means that things are only they can only be used for this one purpose. Right. And um, it's it, it it's a kind of a pigeonholing way to think about things, and it limits your creativity in trying to do something that's in a new context. Um, people aren't going to invent new things right. if they decide to not even try it because they've already, you know, before even starting, they've decided that it's not going to work. Right. So you, you have to be open-minded to try things that are likely to fail. And sometimes what happens is the thing that you were trying along the way winds up, you, you know, revealing something else that you right. didn't set out to try to discover. Um, that that started uh, happened with curiosity, um, like before the curiosity control decks came out, there were um, a, a bunch of curiosity decks that had to do right. with uh, you know firebrand archer and reckless fireweaver and stuff like that, which were just you know a- almost like memes that I was trying in a couple of different decks. One of them was actually a Flash Hulk deck, <laughs> and one of them was a Nekusar deck. <laughs> what was and, the pile in that one? There was a pile, wasn't it? I forget what the pile oh, it, was. It, it, there were a number of piles that depended on kind of the, the, the shape of the board. But, I mean, uh, one of them was Tandem Lookout with Fireweaver. Uh, with, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you just put together your, your, your Curiosity Engine where anything that you cast from that point is going to give you three cards every time you cast anything. And, um, I mean, 
no, I don't play that deck anymore because it wasn't great, but it wound up spawning other ideas right. that, I mean, that I was able to carry through to other things, but then other people also, said, well, okay, maybe, you know, maybe we can use this a little bit. And you have right. other lists that, that materialize um, that, I mean, people, people play curiosity control. People play, you know, decks that are using artifacts or, you know, kind of the, they're, they're using these little, little pieces of things that people tried from, from way back when, because they revealed stuff that actually wound up being good. Mm -hmm. So, um, or I'm, I wander a lot from, from, from topic to topic. Oh no, I understand. I mean, I mean, just to jump off of that just a little bit, like with that, like, I mean, even right now, so your fair magic deck inspired me. Um, (laughs) so, and there's just like all, I'm trying all these new things with Lavinia. And last (laughs) night we played some games and uh, one of the new additions I put in there was Urza in the main board. Okay. And at first I was like, oh, this is going to be dumb. And then I got my lock out with an Urza out. And I was like, oh, I can just cast through the knowledge pool lock and just win the game. Like I can just keep casting spells off this and don't have to worry about what's under there. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. I mean, it just opens up the game. Um, and then I'm also, I don't, know how i feel about them yet but i'm trying like eldrazi displacer and trying like some glass pool mimic stuff because i'm playing like uh eidolon of rhetoric so at worst glass pool mimic is a bad land or a second rule of law sure um so i'm trying to see where that's going we'll probably go nowhere but urza and phantasmal image are definitely going to be in the next version (laughs) yeah i've i've found especially if you're 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 in a stacks list or or something that wants to put proactive hate pieces especially creature oriented hate yeah. pieces onto the board um your your phantasmal images and your mirror images and, and things like that um, are extremely powerful because depending on what it is that you need to shore up in the game right so uh you know d- depending on on the the place where you need to exert a little bit more force to be able to hold people off of their game plans, you mm-hmm. can double up on some particular piece. So, you know, doubling up on rule of law to to make sure that no one's really going to wiggle out of the rule of law because they have to right. break through two of them or something like that. Um, having the the flexibility to be able to, you know, exert that extra pressure in a very kind of um, targeted way um, is useful. And right. I, I I think that. The fact that you can also just happen to, oh, somebody has a dock side, I'm going to copy your dock side too. I also have uh, a dock side. <laughs> yes. You know, so, um, or, you know, oh, you stole my, my creature with, with Gilded Drake here. I'm going to copy your Gilded Drake and take well, it back. Well, I got, I got really cheesy with Phantasmal Image last night. Somebody was playing that Turbo Nas Corvold list. Mm-hmm. And um, so that comes out and I it like smacks me in the face and I have Gilded Drake. So I Gilded Drake it. Uh, goes around a turn. On the end step before my next turn, uh, somebody flashes in a notion thief um, to stop the Corvold from doing things. Right. Um, I top deck phantasmal image, and yes. I was like, "Well, this is a happy That's... coincidence." Right. <laughs> and so I had a notion thief and a Corvold, and um, would you believe it? I won that game. <laughs> right. Who would Who would have thought? Being able to to choose who it is that that gets the card is yeah. Is, um... It's very fun. Useful side effect. So, so we, we we talked about you know we're we're looking at like, um, the card combo you know, whatever theme it is you know like you're working on fair magic right now or fair sure. or what mm-hmm. what is the exact name of the deck? I've seen you call it a couple things. Right. So so this one is called fair or magic. So originally, okay. um, the, the the first deck w- was kind of a meme. It was it was intended to uh, fight against. Hulk decks and to fight against the, you know, the 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 fast Nas decks that existed at that point. Mm-hmm. So um, while while Flash was still legal, you didn't still you, you didn't you didn't see the proliferation of Turbo Nas that you see now. But Turbo Nas right. was still a thing back then. It just wasn't as good. Back and then we it, talk about it like it was forever ago. <laughs> right. I mean, way back in February. Um, <laughs> but. So the the idea was to be able to shut down those decks, and and it actually ran Flash Hulk <laughs> anyway, and in, in, in a deck that was trying to shut Flash Hulk down, um, 
but the 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 idea was and it was it was it was absolutely a meme because you you ran flash hulk and the intent was you either used flash hulk to get a copy of uh, archon of valor's reach and just name instant or you would use flash hulk to go and get um either sanctum prelate and like a phantasmal image or if you already had a sanctum prelate out you would go and get phantasmal image and mirror image just to be able to say i've got three <laughs> sanctum prelates on one two and three and the idea was to it it intentionally not have a win con and the the in, the intent was that you beat people with elish norn and multiple copies of um archon of valor's reach and because it was a it was a thrasios and timna deck so right. uh you're you're using those engines you're using your thrasios engines and you're using your timna engines to create advantage incremental advantage mm -hmm. um especially in a in a situation where your opponents if you've got two archons on instant sorcery where most of the time, if you're playing against a Turbo Nas deck at that point, they they literally can't do anything, right? You know, um, so you're just beating them to the beating them beating them to death with, you know, turning creatures sideways, and the that way is magic, the way Richard Garfield intended, right? And that's a humiliating <laughs> way to lose in CEDH to you know just creature beats, um, and that was that was the idea, and that was fair magic, and then what happened was I. I, I mean, the, the deck was fun, but it, it wasn't as consistent as it could be. And right. it, it, the, the idea was, and, and you still have this today, so the, the fundamental underpinning of the deck is you don't want people to be on their game plans. Right now, the game plan that people are on is to be able to cast, you know, Demonic Consultation or Tainted Pact or, you know, cast uh, a lot of low CMC interaction and, and build up a board state and, and win as soon as they can. And this is trying to attack that in every conceivable direction. So this is right. using rule of law effects. This is using um, effects that say you can't cast instants or you can't cast sorceries or you can't cast spells that cost one, two, or three, or you one, two, and three, depending on your circumstances. <laughs> um, but you want to make sure that you can break parity with that. Right. And so the way that you break parity with that is by creating advantage without casting spells. And you're, especially in, in creature-oriented strategies, your main ways of doing that are things like Yisan and Fiend Artisan and uh, Academy Rector. You know, these, these things where there's either activated or triggered abilities on a creature that you can then use to just choose another piece to put directly into play. And... Um, while while those engines are, are really good, if you don't have a way to give those things haste, then it's it, it's not going to be great because it you're going to telegraph to the table what it is that right. you're up to. People will be able to interact with it, and it's, it's just not as good as it could be. So I switched it to Kenrith because Kenrith, it gives you really everything you could ever conceivably want. Right. Um, he, he gives you the ability to give those things haste. He gives you a pseudo Thrasios outlet for using infinite mana to right. be able to, to end the game. Um, he gives you the ability to reanimate cards um, as, as an activated ability. So it, this is, a, this is a deck that is winning with Thassa's Oracle, but it doesn't run demonic consultation or tainted pact. The idea is you're, you're trying to win off of a hermit druid or mm -hmm. you're trying to win with infinite mana and if you're even if you're in a circumstance where nobody can cast anything because you've got dovescape out or you've got you know a, a possibility storm plus rule of law or something like that and nobody can cast anything if you draw your deck you just move to your discard and then reanimate the thassa's oracle before right. passing turn and then you win so the the idea is to find a way to make the game as poisonous for everybody else's game plans as you can while still being able to not be impeded in your own game right. plan. And so you, it's a trick. It's a trick to find that. Right. But once you find it, you're you're going to it's it's often very successful where it can be. Right. So once you kind of come up with um an idea like that, so whether it's, you know, I want to build around Eureka 
or I want to build around curiosity or I want to make a farm deck. Um, Mm -hmm. When you're starting to now come and you're going, okay, how do I actually win the game? And I feel like everybody just kind of defaults to, oh, well, if you have blue and you have black, you can play Thos's Oracle and Demonic Consultation. Um, But, you know, so outside of that, you know, so what is it that you really do to, like, find the win conditions and all those things? So depending on the the, the kind of deck that you're playing, you're going to have kind of a a different density of the kinds of things that you want to be doing. So uh, in Advantage Thrasios, for instance, the, the goal of the deck is to be all about interacting with what everybody else is doing it's you know the if if there was right. a like a thesis to the deck it's always have an answer <laughs> and you know you you're you're all in on getting as much advantage out of thrasios as you can right. and then just keeping your hand stacked with all of the interaction as possible so the idea in in a deck like that is well i'm want i want to run way more i want to commit a lot more slots to interaction right. than you might in your normal deck you, you can you can think of it kind of like there's kind of the 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 benchmark if you look in the database for kind of the the, the number of counter spells people tend to play and the number of rocks people tend to play and so on and so forth and you kind of got this kind of like um, middle of the road benchmark for uh, what is typical and then you can shift slots in favor of one thing or another mm-hmm. depending on the, the the style of gameplay that you want so for advantage Thrasios, you're 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 pushing that sl- number of slots that are committed to interaction higher, right? And then, well, now you need to reclaim the slots that you've committed to that from someplace else. And uh, one of the ways that you can do that is by choosing win cons that are also interaction. And right, it it used to be you know long ago that you kind of like well you had your combo pieces and you had your win cons and they were always things that were separate from mm-hmm. the the nuts and bolts of how you protected that combo and how you interacted with the rest of the table and part of that is just we've got cards that have been printed like <laughs> finale of devastation where it's like oh great this is a utility card this brings creatures back from the grave it tutors creatures out and oh it does also everything is you a want it to do right so rather than having a a card that is like um you know what's what's a a combo piece that that does nothing until you're you're ready to combo out with it um mm-hmm. you know uh, i'm i'm trying to think of the the storm spell that is oh, uh, um, two two grape black shot. black or sure grape shot is one of them where you know if you're not ready to use it it's a it's a dead card and you're not going to Oh, you're talking about tendrils. Having. Yes, okay. tendrils. Thank you. Um, where, you know, that was that was a card that people ran, and they don't need to to do that anymore because right. we've gotten cards that have been printed since then that allow us to really, really, um, you know, rein in the number of slots that we have committed to winning, right. to committing more and more slots to being able to keep interactive with what's happening Mm -hmm. at the rest of the table and i i I just want to say with the printing of opposition agent oh my god that is going to i i think require a shift in people's deck building philosophies Mm -hmm. because if you are caught unawares that card on its own depending on how you've built your deck if you've built your deck in a way that Oracle is your only win con, for instance, Mm -hmm. and you have nothing else. Uh, You know, everything else is are are layers of ways to get to Oracle in different manners. If you happen to do a vampiric tutor, and then someone snipes your vampiric tutor and orphans your Oracle, right? um, You know, you're that that's that's not a great place to be. So there's there's kind of this this pendulum swing of being able to be greedier and greedier with the the way that you are allocating your slots and um, cards getting printed that punish people for being right. greedier and greedier well, with and the way you're good at, allocating their slots. Especially once that comes out, you're like, you have to respect the two and a black anytime it's sitting up. Absolutely. 
like it's just you're gonna have to respect that and i uh we've talked about this on twitter some too um i am curious to see uh what that does to the meta um i was just talking to uh brayden from cdh cast last night and he asked me um what he thought as far as like you know like lavinia's stocks right in the meta game and i'm mm-hmm. like honestly i have no idea like it certainly doesn't hurt our deck because right. we already run like four tutors and that's it um but i'm not sure what it does and that's kind of what i'm looking at the meta game and uh the biggest thing for me is i'm just like i mean is imperial seal good anymore like, i mean absolutely uh I, what i would say is tutors are still going to be good tutors are always going to be good mm-hmm. i think that it's it's on the one hand, like I was saying, it's going to impact the way that people build their decks just because they're they're going to be more prone to punishment right. when they get caught. Um, that's just one piece of it, though. It, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to run tutors. It just means that people are going to play their tutors differently. They're going to be right. more conservative. They're going to be a little bit less cavalier about, you know, looking around the table and saying, well, no, I'm going to I'm just going to fire off my my tutor here. Um because there's this possibility that okay that person has access to black mana mm-hmm. and you know they've they've you know m- most if you look at it today okay if you if you know that somebody is on blue and black and they've got four mana open a lot of times you can kind of smell that there's a notion thief coming right <laughs> when there's a notion thief on its way people people can i mean you can tell and um I, I think that people will gain that same sense with opposition agent as well. And and not to go off topic, I, I, this is something I do want to mildly touch on, is because people have talked about, well, oh, it's just better even mind sensor. And I'm like, well, yes, but you are not getting punished by even mind sensor the same right. way that you're going to get punished by uh, opposition. It's not even in the same like league. Right. Like uh, the difference is. I can look at my top four. Oh, I whiff. The other one is, oh, you got my win con now. You just got to, uh, what's it called? What's the... Praetor's uh, Grasp? Yeah, you just got to Praetor's Grasp me. Yes. Um, And that is that is not even in the same neighborhood of power. Right, right. I mean, uh, I'm just, I'm glad that they, they decided not to... Not to to, to make the spell free if your commander was on the battlefield or something like that. Just, um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that level of power creep past what wizards of coast has, has been. Yeah. I been mean, doing I, recently, I, but I've said this, I was like, I think somebody was like doing Coke in the, in the R and D department that day. And I, I was mean, just like, what's the craziest it, thing we could do? Yeah. It's so, and I mean, just to, to maybe put the little perspective there too, though, I mean, it's a great card. No, oh, yeah. no one, no one's gonna, no one's gonna argue that. But I don't, I don't think it's a bannable card. I don't think it needs to go. I don't think that it's too good that mm-hmm. the format is going to be warped. I mean, any more than than say, you know, Dockside Extortionist is already warping the format. And yeah. and when, when we say when we say warping the format, um, that that's often something that people read as a very negative sentiment right. oh it warped the format um really what that means is it has changed the format by its presence and the fact that people know that it's there and know that it can be or will be coming right um it changes the way that they play and changes the way that they build their decks right. Dockside extortionist has done that this agent is going to do the same thing it's not going to ruin cedh and it's it it you know, it it might push some decks out. Some decks may have that that are very dependent on being able to tutor profitably. Those decks might uh, not be able to survive its mm-hmm. presence. But I I I am hesitant to maybe have all the doom and gloom that maybe right. some of the people out on Twitter have been you know I mean proliferating. I mean I've said this, uh, and we'll move on after this. But it's um, sure. I I've said this is. Uh, um, I've really only advocated for two bands in Magic ever in my life, um, and that was I of Ugin and Modern, because I lived through <laughs> the Eldrazi. <laughs> Eldrazi's. Winter. That was 
miserable. Oh my. Um, it was I of Ugin and Modern and Flash and EDH. It was the only two yep. that I've ever looked at and gone, the format cannot deal with this. Right. There, it does not have the, and, and especially with Flash, um, I, I think one of my friends put this perfectly, um, is the problem with Flash became the best answer to Flash was a Flash of your own. Right. Um, and that's that's the issue. Um, and so I'm I'm curious to see what happens with it. Um, I, and I'm kind of with you. I don't know that it's ban worthy. Uh, it's definitely something to keep your eye on. Yeah. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, but all that said, so we're looking at these these cards and these the interaction slots and all these things. And one thing, especially when we're talking about this, because I I think it's important because I know when I started, it was a lot. I didn't understand this difference of the difference between a win condition and a combo. Sure. Uh, a lot of times people will, will, will pair those together because, you know, once someone has started their combo, that's when they win. But, right. um, uh, the, the combos are the, they, the, the set of cards that when they come together, they cause you to be able to end the game, right. but they're not necessarily the thing that wins you the game. So, for instance, Leonin, Relic Warder, and Animate Dead. That right. creates an infinite combo where you've got an infinite number of sacrifices taking place, an infinite number of creature enter the battlefield, you know, effects take place, and so on right. and so forth. But on its own, that doesn't win you the game. It just postures you to be able to win the game if you have something that maybe draws you a card whenever something gets sacrificed or right. you know uh, something that removes you know you know something that that you know gains life or removes life when creatures die or something like that so uh, understanding the the actual win con that you want is is useful to help you to choose maybe the 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 most efficient and when i say efficient here i mean um, card efficient, as in most compact right. number of slots, uh, win, you know, win apparatus, we'll say, and that's combo right. plus win con. And this, you know, you, you, a few minutes ago, you, you said, well, are you, are you playing blue and black? Then you might as well run, right. you know, Oracle consultation. I mean, well, absolutely. There's, it's, it takes three it's slots th up it's in your three deck. slots in your deck. And it's a it's a combo and it's a win con, you know it's 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 everything that you need it to be, hyper efficient both in slots and in mana cost, and it doesn't require any state. And that's right. a that's another key, uh, key piece to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, which which combos you want because you want your your combos to be executable kind of. Uh, given a moment's notice you know you've right. you've, you've got you've got the, the the cards in hand you want to be able to to, to win um and, and that's the kind of the reason why you don't really see isocrine scepter and dramatic reversal right. as much as you used to because well that's not a zero state combo that requires a, a good amount of setup to mm -hmm. and it's and it's non -de, you know non-deterministic to to be able to say, oh, I've got dramatic reversal in my hand. Um, now all I need is ice conceptor and I'm good. No, <laughs> you also need <laughs> have to, to be, be able mana to have, positive, right? Um, and you that that brings in an, another layer of the 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 surfaces that you expose to other people to interact with, right? So ice conceptor and dramatic reversal. Once you have your scepter in play and you want to start your combo the the surfaces that you're exposing to your your opponents are well there's a spell that i'm putting on the stack that i need to have resolve over mm -hmm. and over again um if somebody can either limit the number of spells i can cast or someone can counter my dramatic reversal or someone can turn off my ability to activate artifacts mm -hmm. all of those things are going to shove that 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 combo right there People with removal can remove Ice Conceptor 
Hey, and response. I have lost to an abrupt decay on the isochrome scepter Absolutely. plenty of times. <laughs> People can remove the, the the rocks that are or the rocks or the dorks that are allowing you to be mana positive as well. Right. So there's there's all of these different surfaces that people can interact with to stop that combo. When you have something like Oracle plus consultation, what are what's what what surfaces do you have there? Well, <laughs> you need to be able to cast two spells. So rule of law does hold that up quite well. Right. Um, and you need access to three mana and you need to have those 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 spells resolve. So if people don't interact with those spells while they're on the stack and you are able to get a creature enter the battlefield trigger and no one has a torpor orb or something like that, then well, there's there are no other surfaces for people to interact with. Right. So it's going to be highly resilient to people trying to stop it, and mm-hmm. it's efficient. So it's it's the the perfect storm of, of everything that you want to have in a win con, right? Um, which is why you see it so much because if you have the choice, I mean, if you're in blue and black, you, it's it's a a little bit dishonest intellectually <laughs> to to choose something else right. for no other reason than well. It's 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 not Oracle combo. That's well. I mean, like even in our budget build of Lavinia, I know I keep bringing that up. It's the deck I work on all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the budget version of that, I mean, we have Helm of Awakening, and this is like this talking about surface area. This is a really good example, is because like Thor doesn't automatically mean like oh this is resilient. Like one of the combos in there is Future Sight top Helm of Awakening and Thor. And you just draw your deck, and even then you're just kind of rolling the dice of I have these four things. If you disrupt any of them, my combo's done. Right, right. So there's th- those are those are things that when, when I'm building a deck, um, let's say that we're not in blue and black, okay? Right. <laughs> and and Oracle isn't isn't something that's just a uh, you know a, a shoe in that you right that everyone just agrees is going to be in the deck, uh, then there, there's there's more decisions that you need to make. Um, but whenever possible, if, so for instance, if I've got white and blue, then, mm. you know, maybe there's there's a chance that you can use Windfall as right. a way, you know, Angel's Grace and Windfall, draw your deck, and then Windfall, which is not a win con, becomes a win con, right. even though most of the time you're not going to use it in that capacity. So uh, you want to look for every opportunity that you can to be able to to bake those sorts of. It's it's the same thing like the um, the MDFCs that right. just got printed, where they're they're great because depending on the context that you're in, you can use them in different ways. Right. So you have the same idea here with things like Finale of Devastation, things like mm-hmm. Windfall, things like. Uh, you know, people using Beast Within loops back in the day um, to to go infinite. Oh man! Um, but you know, you 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 look for for those sorts of things f- in addition to looking th- for for things that are just going to be uh, devoted win cons right. that don't have any other purpose outside of 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 the combo apparatus. Okay, so that's kind of I, I really appreciate that because I think that really does a good job of like explaining the difference and why they matter right um so when we're when we're looking at you know the whole deck p you know we're, we're building our deck we've got our combo uh we've got our win con we've got all these things um so now obviously there's more to the deck than i have my combo and win con in my commander uh now i have you know 85 cards to fill um right. how are we coming up with that so, um, what what I do is, you know, I, I keep kind of some spreadsheets that I okay. I just I I keep on hand that are, you know, you know, just like uh, you know, guys from playing with power, you know, you have there's a number of resources that are uh, out on the internet where where people kind of have the their staples lists and, and things like yeah. that. Um, you know, I I keep I keep a spreadsheet of the you know the 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 interaction that sees play 
and you know the 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 acceleration that keeps play, uh, the 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 tutors that see play, and, and mm-hmm. so on and so forth, just as a starting point mm-hmm. to you know to to kind of to fill in the 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 initial composition. Okay. So, um, and you're almost always going to take those kind of in 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 the order of you know casting cost. For instance, you're you're going right. to be looking at things like you know swan song before you're looking at things like negate and um the the idea is you you're like i said before where there's kind of like this this baseline of well seems like most decks run somewhere between eight and 13 counter spells it seems Mm -hmm. like most decks run somewhere between five and nine tutors and like i i i do go through the decks on the database and i kind of keep tabs on the numbers as far Mm as um what what slots they're committing to what and um kind of use that as the baseline to 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 have like that first draft of okay well this is this is the amount of interaction that i'm going to start with this is the amount of tutoring i'm going to start with rocks and so on and so forth then um once you're there that's that's just the kind of like the the skeleton those are just kind right. of like the bones because ev- every deck is going to need to have interaction. Every deck is going to mm-hmm. need to have tutors and, and so on and so forth. Um, from there, the the things that are special about the deck mm-hmm. are what are going to inform kind of the rest of what you're doing. So if you're on Anala, then that is going to suggest, okay, you're, you're going to start using maybe some wizards that... Mm-hmm wouldn't normally make the cut but because of the advantage that you can get through the eminence ability maybe um that will you know uh embolden you to you know bring bring in some of those those cards because in that context they can be really good and then you maybe if you're on yarrick or something (laughs) you're 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 gonna in in the same way you're gonna look at cards that are something that is specific either to the commander or cards that lend themselves well to the um like the patterns of play that you're trying to put together so if you're if the 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 pattern of play that you're looking to establish is turbo nas then that's going to that's going to inform the the choices for the right. kinds of things that you're going to put into the deck. Um, Turbo Nas means that you're going to sacrifice some of your slots that are interaction slots, and instead you're going to commit those to faster acceleration. You're going to have higher density of, of uh, rituals. You're going to have higher density of rocks that are, or ways of generating mana that are, you know, uh, zero state so that you can, that so that either you can get your NAS off the ground faster, or once your NAS has completed, you don't have to have any mana left over to be able to continue going. You right. can start from zero and keep going. Um, but the you know the the constraints that come from the type of game that you want to play will inform the choices that you make as far as the what what cards you're you're gonna also add into the mix beyond just the skeleton right and also those things as well will will and will push some of those things from the skeleton out so turbo nas okay so you're probably not going to have 13 car- counter spells you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna take down some of those counter spells and you're gonna try to reduce your your average cmc as much as possible so that you can get right. the most profitable nauses that you can so that's going to push out some of the, the 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 cards that are more reactive, it's going to push mm-hmm. out the cards that are higher CMC in favor of things that are lower. Um, so th- th- those are the kinds of things that will dictate the uh, kind of the ebb and flow of what content you have inside that list. Right. And sometimes, you know what i I don't feel bad about looking at EDH rec. You know, if I, yeah. if if if, if if, if somebody said, hey, can you put together a Calamax list? Mm-hmm. Because his, you know, his copying ability has some interesting things that we want to try to explore. Okay, I have no problem going to EDHREC and seeing what, what are other people doing? You know, what, what, kind of, what kind of 
cards, even if there's a card that only really is going to work in casual, mm-hmm. it might trigger something when you see it. Oh, wait a minute. There's there's like a way <laughs> far, you know, there's a more optimal way that we could do this with this other card that they're not considering, but we could do it in a different That's way. A- that's uh did you see the I, I don't know if you saw this on Twitter or not, I posted it. Um I was looking for different like combos and stuff earlier today and uh, I was on EDH rec and I was like, What blue white combos are out there? I don't even know. And I saw the Shabraz, the Sky Shark and yep. uh and what's Drog Skull Drog Skull Re- Reaver. Mm-hmm. And Oh uh, my goodness, that's the seven mana white and uh blue yeah. that has double strike and whenever you gain life draw a card yep oh my. and so those two you'd literally just draw your deck and i was sitting there and i was like what if i played sneak attack with that right and then you just like threw it in like there's probably a better way of doing that but sure um like the, that the, was the goal I there, was hilarious right the, the idea there though is just because someone who is coming from a casual mindset is coming up with the idea doesn't make it a bad idea right and it doesn't even mean that it's not an idea that can actually bear fruit in a more competitive metagame mm-hmm. so um yeah edh rec if, if you're if you're if you're looking for something that's like off the wall um <laughs> but if you're if you're looking for something that is you know kind of more seasoned and more kind of established that you know is going to be something that's good for you know for, for competitive i mean looking at the 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 deck list database that you can get to yep. um from reddit and from other places i mean they're those those are the decks that are the decks. So looking at, you know, what what choices are they making for the counter spells that they're taking? Right. What are the choices that they're making for the acceleration they're choosing? What are their choices for which um, interaction pieces that they're including and which interaction pieces they're not including? Mm-hmm. That can help give you some insight into the stuff that works in different contexts, and um, that that context is important as well. So right. if 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 you're if you're wanting to play a stacks deck, then you 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 probably shouldn't start with, you know, the farm decks to look at the cards that you should be including, <laughs> but the the farm decks will help inform the choices you make of how you can hate against those farm decks. Right. Um but if you went and looked at Blood Pod, then maybe that's going to give you some some better choices as to the things right. that might work well within that archetype so you want to try to look at other decks that are of similar archetype and see the things that they're doing and which things will be appropriate for the deck that you're putting together right yeah um yeah i totally love that and like uh and i know you've mentioned this before but i mean you even look at uh mtg top eight and like goldfish and stuff like that too to see like what legacy and all those people are doing yes yes i do because there's sometimes um, there's just things that are the way that things have been done or the ways that things are currently being, you know, being done in death and taxes mm-hmm. in, in, in modern or in legacy, or, you know, the, the way that, uh, shops is approaching, you know, their, their gameplay in, in vintage today or five years ago, um, right. the choices that they were making, um, they're not going to translate verbatim into cedh but right. they can give you ideas of oh wait a minute i never would have thought of trying something like that right and um that that's really the the idea there is to try to look for things that maybe we haven't tried out in a couple of years and mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of times you'll have cards that either have fallen out of favor or that were really good and then for whatever reason either something else got really strong or something mm-hmm. else uh, drew everybody's attention away um, people just stopped playing it not mm-hmm. because it was bad not because it couldn't compete just because something else drew people's attention away from it mm-hmm. and then you'll, you'll find so like there was an era like a year or two ago when nobody ran Ristic Study I remember that that was so and people, weird the, the, the you know the the motherhood and apple pie kind of you know notion was that well everyone knows that that ristic study is not not fast enough you you know you three mana for something that isn't necessarily going to be able to you know generate some number of cards and people rationalized their way out of 
why they weren't including it. And now mm-hmm. it's a, a near universal include, even for really aggressive, fast decks. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's merit in going and looking at things that have worked in the past right. to see if the context has changed such that they can once again have a future. If that makes right. sense. No, that totally makes sense. And so, um, no, that's really awesome. So now once we're, um, we've got all our stuff together, we've got our like initial lists, obviously it comes down to, we got to play test this, right? Right. So, so, so what I do is, um, before I ever actually play it against other people, I will do a lot of gold fishing and I, yeah. I'll, what I'll do is I'll just load it up into cockatrice. And when, when I say a lot of gold fishing, I will probably do between two or 300 runs of trying okay. to, trying to, you know, get to the, a desired game state. And, um, for every single run, I'll, I'll answer, um, what felt good. Oh, f- mm-hmm. oh first of all, the, the first is what was the win con? How did I win? Mm-hmm. So, um, just to see if if you if you roll through fifty times and you you included two win cons in your deck and you used one win con like eighty five percent of the time, it might inform you that well maybe we should you know reinforce Lean the into lines that more. yeah let let's let's just okay let's let's sculpt things a little bit more so that we're we're able to do that more reliably since that seems to be the place that we're going to go anyway or right. it depending you know it could mean that okay is there a way that we could make pivoting between these two things more economical or more equitable mm-hmm. such that uh, maybe the other one sees play more often? You know, there, there may be reasons to, to go in either direction, let's say. So so how do you, and, and I even, <laughs> as a deck creator, how in the world, so, okay, let's say you're sitting down in your um, goldfishing my deck, Lavinia, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, this is a thing I struggle with. How in the world, because especially with a deck like this, that's so circumstantial, every choice I make is, especially when I'm playing like 13 counters, right, is Mm -hmm. based on what is the board state, what's going, I mean, how do you goldfish that? Okay, so um, one of the things that you can do is to kind of have an imaginary set of opponents. Okay. So... um, what you can do is, okay, for, for, for this game, I'm going to imagine that I'm playing against two farm decks and a Godo deck or something like okay. that. And what you would do is for, for you know, every turn during that game, you're going to be thinking if, if you're playing, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're, you're playing uh, a stacks deck, for instance, okay, <coughs> what am I doing against, what am I, okay, what am I doing, uh, to hold Godo off of winning, right? And um, what things do I want to be doing every single turn to make sure that the farm players aren't playing the game that they want to play, right? And I mean, it's it's not going to be the same as actually playing against people, but right. the the purpose of of gold fishing by yourself is to make sure that all of the lines of the deck have uh, cohesion. And Mm -hmm. that the deck itself functions efficiently, right? Because there'll be times that you'll you'll be like, "Ooh, man, um, that 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 line just it 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 felt really rough to to make that work." And um, like I was saying, whenever you finish a game, you're you're gonna say what you how how you won, but then what felt good. As far as mm-hmm. like what cards felt good in hand and you were happy to see, um, what felt bad, where it was like, oh, this, uh, why am I seeing this in my hand? <laughs> and um, which things were missing that you felt like you needed, that had you had that, you would have been able to combo out when you wanted to, or had you had that, you would have been able to um, have something to be able to stop the imaginary Goto player that was to your right. Um, by kind of keeping track, of all of those things, you'll, you'll, you'll see patterns that'll show up where Mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, living plain felt really bad a (laughs) lot of, a lot of the time. And, um, you'll, you'll find yourself making it, it helps you to have the data to make choices. 
if a lot of people make choices based on gut Mm -hmm. and some people have really good gut sense and that's Mm -hmm. great. Um, I like to make my choices based on data and, um, by doing a lot of gold fishing kind of on your own mm-hmm. and being ruthless and being honest about right. what stuff works and what stuff doesn't, which things you need to change, that helps you to kind of get the, the, the deck into a state where it's, it's, it's ready to go against right. real people. So when you're playing it against real people, you're not trying to work out the kinks of stuff that you could already figure out. Right. Okay. So you figure out the kinks that you can on your own, on your own, and then that stuff has been resolved when you're taking it to play against real people. Mm -hmm. Then when you're playing against real people, you can focus and not have to deal with, oh yeah, living plain feels bad. You you don't don't have those moments. Instead, Mm -hmm. it's, oh man, I wish maybe, maybe, maybe one or two more pieces of removal are needed. Uh, because I felt like I didn't have the removal as often as I needed to, mm-hmm. or you know those kinds of things, um, and, th- and that's a thing. I'll, I don't know how many people do this, but taking notes after games is that's just a good practice. So yeah, if you finish up a game and you know you won, or you finished up a game and you lost, you know taking some notes on, you know like what what, what did I learn from this. Mm-hmm. Um, will A, make you a better player, and B, mm-hmm. give you insight into how you can maybe make the deck better. And you know what's interesting about this is, you know, we really like to talk about how EDH is this different beast, right, from the rest of Magic. It's like its own little game inside of a game. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I find really interesting is talking to you about this is this sounds almost identical to what, you know, Reed Duke might do when he's playing a deck uh for like modern or legacy or whatever i mean these that that's and the reason i say that is is we tend to think that oh well the the general rule is with edh it's this whole different thing and i mean we're talking about some principles that are that hold true in all these different formats right right for sure and and i mean for, for what it's worth edh is, it is a very different animal and right. CEDH is EDH and I, I the reason I say this is some people when they want to when they want to inhabit the EDH mindset they don't want to take notes they don't want to right. improve the deck they don't want to be cuz that's for when they're playing legacy and they don't they right. want to they want to respite from legacy and that's why they're doing EDH right now and that's 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 fine yeah. Um, but for for the people who are wanting to really have that CEDH mentality and who want to inhabit that space, um, mm-hmm. the, these are these are good habits to have. And you're right. Right. These are the same habits that people have in those other competitive formats. I think it's hilarious when people uh, not to say that it's it's funny that people play EDH for like respite or whatever. I get that. But the way that like I play um like standard is or historic is how people play edh normally you know what i mean like when i'm like okay sure. i've been playing competitive edh i need a break uh right. i'll go load up and i i have this goofy soul tie dredge deck in historic and i just have a blast with it i don't always win right um but i just have a blast and that's a, and that's that's what i think is interesting is it's just you know the difference and, but the difference of how the mentality is, but still there's that connecting thread for both of them. For sure. I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it, 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 it makes sense given kind of the, the, the jokeable state that standard has been in for a while anyway, <laughs> that people would just go there when they want to mess around because they don't want to take it seriously. Um, that <laughs> there's, it stands to reason that <laughs> you would approach it in that way. <laughs> so standards been goofy but yeah so um so we goldfish it and so especially when okay so i want to play against people um right now we're kind of living in incredibly unprecedented times so it's a little bit different um but how what is it you go about because i know you're you, you play with the lab maniacs although you guys haven't done as much stuff recently um 
Yeah, the you know, lab, I I haven't um, really we we don't really uh, interact very often at all. Yeah, um, I would say I'm 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 maybe one or two of us still play mm-hmm. CEDH, and okay. um, a couple don't even play Magic the Gathering anymore. Oh wow! So okay. There 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 have been some 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 pretty intense you know shifts to other interests and other hobbies yeah. and that's the thing that happens in life right you know, people get excited about certain things but then other things you know that's there's a whole lot of places right. for people to find joy and right. Absolutely. i think it's really good that people keep doing that and yeah. allow themselves to evolve so well yeah so I as find, far as like playing um what is it they you know you do to play with other people I will most often um, play with people on spell table currently. Okay. So I've got kind of a, a local metagame of, you know, people who live close by. Um, we don't play face to face, but we play on spell table. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll also play, you know, with, with, with other people through um, the, the, the organized games that take place on Nexus and, uh, through semi-organized games that take place on cockatrice as well, mm-hmm. okay, and uh, that that's just helpful in general for playing uh, CEDH, mm-hmm. just because not every you know local game store is going to have a bunch of people right. that are maybe as devoted or as invested in CEDH. So if I you am really incredibly to, lucky with that, <laughs> right? If if you want to diversify the, the people that you're playing against, then you know using the internet as as mm-hmm. a resource is is the way to do that yeah um and you mentioned like uh cdh nexus that's um discord the discord server yes okay mm-hmm. and they they organize they they have events that take place um and it's it's hard to say because there, there's a there's a couple of uh, i mean there's a lot of people who are part of multiples of these mm-hmm. hubs right so, um, you, you've got a, a number of hubs that connect through Discord. Um, right. Some of them use Spelltable. Some of them use, um, you know, just webcam games that they use through 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 other types of uh, software and stuff like that. And some of them use Cockatrice. And it's just connecting people who yeah. are kind of like on, a, let's say, same level of investment. The people who right. are who are way into it. And um, you you are able to get kind of a round experience because you're not just limited by the same you know four or five guys that you're, right. you're interacting with in your local meta. Right. Well, especially with that, you can kind of get these these decks that are, and you, I mean, you see this in all sorts of formats, um, like especially like F and M's and stuff, where you'll get these decks that are uh, tooled specifically. I, I think to like my modern meta game. Uh, right. We have one of the top two storm players in the country who plays at our store, uh, so everybody's packing storm hate. Um, but as far as the national meta game goes, nobody's worried about storm, right? You know, right, so right. Um, that's and I agree with you totally. That's why I think it's really important to go online and play with people and interact with different people because uh, then you're really gonna see what's out there and mm-hmm. uh, it'll broaden your horizons for sure. Absolutely. So, well, um, with that, um, we've kind of gone over a ton, uh, and we've been, I could, I swear to God, I could probably talk to you about magic all day long. Um, <laughs> I, I, I could do the same. So, yeah. Um, but it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, I would love to have you back, honestly. Uh, For sure. it's been awesome talking with you. Um, one day I'd love to make a deck with you and just throw ideas at the wall. Um, we can make that happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so with that, um, I'm Callahan. That's Cobblepot, and you're listening. This was the Mind Sculptors, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good one.